In the last episode, we learned the basics of macro syntax. Now let's dive deeper into pattern matching. Pattern matching is the heart of how declarative macros work. They match patterns in your code and generate code based on what they find. The more patterns you understand, the more powerful your macros become. Let's look at practical examples that you might actually use in real code. Sometimes you want to match a type to create type aliases or generic helpers. Let's create a macro that generates a result type alias. So here we're going to use macro rules as always, and the name will be result type. This time the identifier is going to equal the result with OK and err, or this is the pattern we're going to match against. And when that happens, we'll generate this code. So to use it, we're going to type in result type as a macro and create something called my result, which will equal a result of i32 and string. Then we can create a simple function that returns my result. And from that point onward, we can handle that example. So here we will match the example. If it's okay, we will print success with the value. Otherwise, if there's an error, we will print the error with its error message. So what's important to note here is that okty and erty match the types and that this macro creates a type alias for a result type, which can make your code more readable when you use the same result type in many places. Next, let's move on to matching literals. Literals are useful when you want to ensure compile time constants. Let's create a macro that generates constants from literals. So as always, we're going to use macro rules, and this time the name will be const from literal. And what's important to note here is that we're using the literal specifier, which ensures we only accept actual literals, not variables. And this is going to be very useful for creating constants that must be known at compile time. Then inside here, we create a constant with the name and we stringify it. Now to use this, all we have to do is call the macro with a name of our choice. And from that point onward, we can use it as a constant. As you can see, when we run this, what we get as an output is the API version and the default port using the constants. Next, let's talk about matching paths using the path specifier. Paths are useful when working with modules. Let's create a macro that helps with importing and using items from paths. So here we will create a macro called use and call, and this will take a path or will match a path. And in a real scenario, this would use the path. But in this example, we're just going to print it. Next, we can use the macro and insert a path, such as this one over here that creates a new hash map. Or we can also use standard out. And now when we run this, we're going to see in the console that we're using each of these. The path specifier matches qualified paths. This is useful when creating macros that work with different modules or crates, though in practice, you typically use use statements directly. Up next, we're going to match blocks. Blocks are powerful for creating control flow macros. Let's create a more useful timing macro that also prints what's being timed. So in this example, we're going to create a benchmark macro. And this takes the name of the expression and the block. Then here we get the start time, the result will be how long it took to execute the block and the duration will be the time since start. Then we will print the time it took to execute that block and return the result. Then inside here, we can create some functionality which uses the benchmark macro and the name will be calculate sum. Then inside here, the code we will use is this one over here, which just adds i to total a lot of times. And then at the bottom, we can also print the result. So right now, if we were to run this, what we should get as an output is that it took 1.2 milliseconds and that the result is this number over here. I tried to read it, but I failed. So here, block block matches a block of code. This macro wraps the block with timing code and a label, making it easy to benchmark different parts of your code. This is a practical use case you might actually end up using. Next, let's talk about matching statements. Statements are useful for generating code that executes multiple times. Let's create a macro that retries a statement. So here, we're going to create a macro called retry. The expression will be called max attempts and the statement will just be named statement. Here, we're going to keep track of the attempts and create a loop. Then we can insert the statements and for each time we run it, we're going to add one to the attempts. If the attempts is greater than or equal to 
the max attempts, we're going to break out of this loop. Now to use this, we're going to create a counter. And then inside here, we're going to call the retry macro. And inside the retry macro, we're adding the number of the attempts followed by the statement we want to execute. Now, when we run this, what we should get as an output is attempt one, attempt two, and attempt three. So as you can see, the statement specifier matches statements. This example shows how you might create a retry mechanism, though in practice, you'd want more sophisticated error handling. Next, we're going to talk about combining matches. You can combine multiple matches to create powerful macros. Let's create a macro that generates a struct with a constructor. So for this example, we're going to create a macro called struct with new. And what this macro does is create a struct definition along with a new constructor. It matches an identifier for the struct name, then a block with field definitions. And finally, each field has a name and a type. This is more useful than just creating the struct. It also generates a convenient constructor. To show you how it works, we're going to go to main and create a point using struct with new. Then we can create a new point using that struct. And finally, we can print the point and its values. And when we run this, what we should get as an output is a point with the values of three and four. Next, let's take a look at how we can match specific tokens to create custom syntax. Let's create a macro that provides a cleaner way to create key value pairs. So here we'll create a macro called KV which takes a key as an identifier and a value as an expression. And what it does is turn that into a key value pair. Then we're going to create a person named Alice, and we're going to let the age equal 30. And to use our macro, we just need to call KV exclamation mark, provide an identifier and the value. Then to see what's inside, we can print pair one and pair two. And as soon as we print that, we should get back these key value pairs. So here we're matching the arrow token to create a DSL-like syntax for key value pairs. The macro automatically converts the identifier to a string, which can be useful for configuration or logging. And finally, as the last part of this video, we're going to talk about conditional matching. You can create macros that handle different cases flexibly. Let's create a macro that works with or without a trailing comma which is a common pattern in Rust macros. So here we'll create a macro called create array. And what this macro is going to do is allow us to create an array with or without a trailing comma. As you can see here, we have one, two, three without a trailing comma, and we have four, five, six with a trailing comma. And what's cool about this is that both of them work. Now I know this looks like a lot of syntax, but what's important to note here is that right here, we're telling Rust with the question mark that this should optionally match a comma. This makes the macro more flexible and user-friendly. It works whether or not there's a trailing comma. And this is a very common pattern in Rust macros.